is an inhibitory process. <coughs> that means that the effect of benzodiazepines means is to basically sedate neurons all over the human body and brain. Because GABA as a neurotransmitter is used widely throughout the central nervous system and because it's used in the brain so much, in fact it's the primary inhibitory receptor in the brain, benzodiazepines have wide, widespread effects on a variety of processes in the body and the brain, including, of course, dealing with fear and anxiety, which is why they help people with their stress but also affecting muscle tension, affecting memory, affecting all kinds of uh, postural controls, um, muscle movements, uh, sensory processes, wide, widespread effects. So when we're trying to treat stress, we may be targeting a specific area in the brain, like for example, the amygdala, which is the source of the stress response, the source of the fear response, the source of the anxiety response. We're targeting that part of the brain. And what we're doing is trying to increase the in inhibition that occurs in those GABA-containing neurons in the amygdala. But this space in the brain is not the only part of the human body that is being affected by benzodiazepines. There are widespread effects. So this background is really important for people to keep in mind as you think about the fact that we're treating a certain problem, often sleep difficulties, often anxiety difficulties, with a medication that has many more effects than we need. So let's look at some of the common uses of benzodiazepines, especially remembering that in the United States we have the highest volume of benzodiazepine sales in the entire world. The most frequently prescribed medication um, for anxiety disorders, benzodiazepines. And especially generalized anxiety disorder and panic disorder are disorders that are often resulting in this prescription. Often primary care practitioners are prescribing it for insomnia, we find that college students' use of benzodiazepines is rising, especially Xanax. And often these medications are administered along with SSRIs because SSRIs have an initial effect of increasing anxiety. And so when individuals are being treated for anxiety, we give them SSRIs to treat their anxiety. That increase of anxiety is something that leads prescribers to sometimes combine the medication with benzodiazepines in order to decrease that initial anxiety. Also, these medications are used for anti-convulsants effects to um, treat seizure disorders. They're used to promote muscle relaxation when people have tension and muscle difficulties. And also, they're prescribed to reduce agitation, often associated with a variety of disorders, including dementia, including psychotic disorders. Now there's definitely beneficial effects of benzodiazepines. They are quickly absorbed, they are one of the fastest acting medications that you can have. They, they achieve peak levels within 30 minutes and both physicians and patients are often very pleased with the results that these medications uh, produce because a person feels a difference in their emotional state or in their, their muscle tension or whatever very quickly. And so because they have this quick and effective relief from anxiety and emotional distress, they're very tempting medications for people to feel that they are solving the problem. Uh, the anticonvulsant effect that they have for seizure disorders is, is widely demonstrated. And we definitely see that people will report that they help reduce their anxiety in the first use, in the first weeks of using of SSRIs. But there's a very dangerous combination being offered to our clients at this point. Patients are being given a medication, the SSRI, that they feel like doesn't have any immediate effect. And at the same time, they're given another medication that they feel has a very immediate effect. Which medication do you think this patient is going to prefer or think is useful? The one that works more quickly. Also, there's definite evidence that these can be an effective sleep aid. And 
I don't know how impressed I am by falling asleep four minutes earlier, but that was what meta-analysis revealed. But increased sleep during the an hour, getting more sleep is a very important thing, especially to those anxious and stressed out individuals that we're treating. Another thing that's good about these medications, they're off patent, so they're inexpensive medications. They don't cost a lot of, a lot of money to get these medications. But where's the rub? It's in the detrimental effects that benzodiazepines have. The side effects that they have, because there are so many GABA receptors throughout the body and the brain, they're going to have many more effects on your body and your brain than you intend. So they create overall sedation, daytime drowsiness, ataxia, where there are balance problems and movement problems, there's discoordination, slurred speech, or decreased attention, impaired memory, um, cognitive performance. People have difficulty learning with these medications in their system. Also, what we're treating people for, these medications only solve the problems when they're in your system and they do not assist when they're not taking them. Relapse rates, if the person begins, begins taking these and then stops taking them, the difficulties come back. It doesn't, it doesn't result in changes. One of the things that I, I tend to explain is, in order to rewire the brain, the brain has to fire. And if you remember, what does the benzodiazepines do? They keep neurons from firing. If you don't rewire, you basically are freezing the brain in the current state that it's in. Learning is difficult, change is difficult on a neuronal level. Now, when you have prolonged use, and when I say prolonged use, you're going to be surprised what I mean by prolonged use. I mean four weeks. I mean just four weeks can be considered um, enough to start to change the brain and the body in such a way that the physiological dependence occurs. And this is when someone is taking the, these medications at the prescribed dose and at the prescribed rate. Tolerance occurs and increased dosage is likely to be required when someone takes them for just weeks. We're talking a matter of days here, not months, but weeks. And then there are dependence and withdrawal effects, which we'll be talking about later. The continued use of these impairs cognitive performance, which uh, for most of us is an important aspect of life, especially as you continue to use them over time. And the side effects are especially of concern in the elderly population because they result in cognitive impairments with that group, which doesn't need that problem, and memory impairments, and also they result in falls. And there's also some difficulty driving, which we'll be talking about. But talking about this withdrawal process, the withdrawal process, I just want to quote someone here, someone that I've known, um, not personally, but I've watched for years, Stevie Nicks, anyone still remember Stevie Nicks? Yeah. She said the worst medication or drug she ever had to get off of, and she had to get off very many of them in rehab. The worst one, clonopin, she said, a benzodiazepine. Benzo withdrawal is a complicated, difficult process. It's difficult to predict because it tends to be different in different people but it has the potential to have long-term debilitating consequences. When we've studied withdrawal, there's a large number of varied symptoms, which are often difficult to recognize as indicators of withdrawal. For example, one is difficulty sleeping, and, and anxiety is another one. And those are the things people sought treatment for. So very often, people who are experiencing withdrawal are told they're just dealing with the problem that they came with. They don't realize that their problem is a problem of withdrawal. And the reason that they're having trouble sleeping is because they develop tolerance to the medication and need an additional, an, an additional dosage. They need the dosage increase. There's a questionnaire, the benzodiazepine withdrawal symptom questionnaire, that has been used to investigate the symptoms. And I just can't tell you the diversity of symptoms that we see. And you know why that is. Because so many parts of the body are affected. So there are perceptual disturbances and sensory disturbances, muscular pain and cognitive dysfunction, dysfunction. People talk about general malaise and aching, dysphoric mood, memory loss, all kinds of disparate symptoms that are often difficult to tie back to these particular medications as the cause. And what makes it more complicated is that the clusters of symptoms tend to change as we go through the withdrawal process, so that it's a very complex process. And most studies that we have based on this, even though we're the country using this 
set of medications the most. Most studies have been conducted in other countries. We really have a lack of studies looking at this. There is a discontinuation syndrome that individuals have when they're coming off benzodiazepines that has been known to prevent successful withdrawal. And especially when people have repeated withdrawal attempts of getting back on the medication, it seems to get worse and worse. People are losing their jobs, they're having relationship issues, they're basically not able to live their lives. So this withdrawal process is also something that we don't have um, medications for. Um, really, very few medications tend to help in the withdrawal process. Patients are attempting to taper gradually, but whereas people who are dealing with opioids have suboxone or methadone, there's different things that we're helping people in terms of other kind of medications and drugs, there is really very few ways to blunt the withdrawal symptoms. And if they're stopped too quickly, benzodiazepines result in seizures and even death. So this is not the kind of thing that someone should come off of quickly. It should be a gradual process. But the empirical study of this whole process is suggesting that we can't always recognize what symptoms individuals are going to be and experiencing. And the truth is there are some individuals who come off them with relatively <coughs> fewer problems. And then sometimes those individuals are considered to be the normal individuals, whereas the others are considered to be the abnormal ones. But I was at a conference recently where someone said, it only appears that only about 60% of people have trouble coming off of these. Only 60%, you know? So that, that's a difficulty. The other problem is that most physicians don't even recognize benzodiazepine withdrawal. And I know other kinds of therapists often don't recognize the signs of benzodiazepine withdrawal. And many aren't even aware that it exists. Only a few physicians are, are prepared to treat benzodiazepine withdrawal and understand the process. And we have repeatedly have clients who are traveling out of state to get assistance with this, with this problem. So typically, benzodiazepine withdrawal is a process that takes years to complete, and the resources for these individuals are extremely, extremely limited. I want to tell you uh, about a group that I was introduced to that is an online community, uh, an online peer support group called Benzo Buddies. How many people here have heard of Benzo Buddies? This is a group that was started by a gentleman from England who was put on benzodiazepines for a seizure disorder, but then when he developed tolerance, he began for the first time in his life having panic attacks and anxiety which he'd never experienced coming directly from the medications and which he was being given for seizures. Now this, the mission of Benzo Buddies is to provide peer support and assistance as people try to come off benzodiazepines. And this group I was introduced to because of individuals I knew who were looking for any help they could get since there were no physicians helping them trying to decrease their use of benzodiazepines. And so there's some statistics here, a study that I conducted in 2013. And at that time, Benzoides had 15,000 members, but I want to tell you 70% of them are from the U.S. trying to get assistance, but it was, it's an international community. So what they do is they try to support each other and help each other giving information um, about the withdrawal process. And what they're often referring to is the Bible of uh, benzodiazepine withdrawal, which is this, this uh, manual by Heather Ashton, who is a physician from England, who really assists people in how to understand how benzodiazepines to work and how they withdraw. So they, they call themselves dependent on benzodiazepines because they are not seeking medications, but they find that their lives fall apart when they try to get off this drug. They are not wanting to take the medication, but they can't live without it. They know that they're physiologically dependent and they want to, to withdraw. Now, one of the things that I found from this group of individuals, they ask us repeatedly, please, please educate for the professional treatment community about the dangers of benzodiazepines and what's happened to us, because we can't get people to even believe that what we're experiencing exists. 
This was the demographics of just the American participants who did a survey for me, who answered this very long, involved survey. And you can see that the majority of, of people are middle-aged adults, 32 and 19 percent individuals who were in this survey. And more, more women are dealing with these issues than men, but we're definitely seeing both of them involved. Once again, all these data are based on the study I did in 2013. The withdrawal status of the people I was looking at in this group, of the 493 people, 29% were in the process of completing the withdrawal process, 9% had tried but couldn't successfully withdraw and had gone back on the benzos, 59% had successfully withdrawn but they were still using the site to cope with the process, and 2% had not attempted withdrawal. Now, why are those 59% still active on the site? Because they report that they're continuing to experience withdrawal effects for months after they have successfully gotten all the benzodiazepines out of their system. So when we asked them about that withdrawal process, we found that 96% reported the withdrawal symptoms continue after discontinuation for months. And what are the kind of withdrawal symptoms we had them reporting? Just quickly, insomnia and anxiety were the first two. Surprisingly enough, those are the things they sought treatment for before, and those are the things that are worsened by taking the medication. Panic was another one. And remember, panic is occurring for people who never had a panic attack before, but only had panic attacks after starting benzodiazepine. There were all kinds of bodily and phys physical complaints and tremors that people reported. We also saw we also saw depression and um, GI problems, um, mood and cognitive difficulties, and pain. But one of the biggest concerns was just the length of time that this, these withdrawal symptoms lasted. The average number of the average amount of time that people reported continuing to feel like they had symptoms was 14 months after discontinuation. This is a long, long process of dealing with the withdrawal process. And why the withdrawal lasts so long? What we're learning is the benzodiazepines result in, in changes in the brain and body that are lasting changes when you use them daily. The inhibition that they produce changes the neurological network in our body. And this occurs whenever these medications are used daily and the brain and body attempt to adjust to this constant increase in inhibition to all of these systems. The brain is not a passive process. You've heard of neuroplasticity. It reacts to these things, it adjusts. And so when that inhibition affects the brain and body, the brain begins to become more and more able to overcome the effects of inhibition. And one way that I describe it as I'm trying to explain it to my students is to say that what we're experiencing is the amygdala, for example, not wanting to be inhibited. It's a very important part of our, of our brain. It doesn't, it doesn't function effectively if it's inhibited. So it's going to fight back to reestablish some kind of equilibrium. And meanwhile, you end up with an amygdala that makes a much stronger anxiety or stress response than it ever did before the exposure to the benzodiazepines. So you're kind of creating um, cells that have much more activation levels than their resting activation levels used to be. All right, so important then to know what's going on when we're taking these medications or we're prescribing these medications. Okay, so should we worry about these? One of the things that people say is that occasional use of benzodiazepines is just not likely to lead to problems. But even just with occasional use, I mean every couple days maybe, or just when you're trying to get on a plane, or when you need to drive to you know, on the highway or something like that. Well, actually, there are some risks, even with occasional use, like impaired cognitive functioning, impaired memory, also impaired driving, impaired balance. We also see increased risks of falls, especially among the elderly. And when you combine these medications with opioids or with alcohol, 
they can be life threatening. So don't think that these medications with occasional use are harmless. One of my clients recently was prescribed clonopin to help her sleep and within days of taking it she had fallen and broken a wrist just because of taking the, the medication. So with extended use now, let's say, now this means that people take them daily. And extended use, remember, means three weeks, four weeks, that's what I'm talking about with extended use. Dependence begins to develop, we see changes in the neurons, and it's rarely detected quickly. We rarely realize dependence is occurring, but we know that as soon as people start to discontinue them, they start to have severe effects, including insomnia, depression, panic attacks, those types of things. So it's really essential that prescribers understand the potential dangers whenever they're prescribing benzodiazepines. And when accidental dependency does develop, what are the options a person has? Very few physicians or psychiatrists recognize the signs of dependency or the signs of benzodiazepine tolerance because they often mimic the symptoms of the very disorders that people came in complaining about. So you're not surprised to hear that they're complaining about these symptoms. And they often also have a cluster of divergent symptoms where someone's coming in and saying they're very sensitive to light or that they're having trouble focusing in class. And you're not necessarily going to recognize these as connected to the benzodiazepines. And then even if you do recognize that very few physicians or psychiatrists have the knowledge or experience of treating benzodiazepine withdrawal, especially when you consider that this takes months to years to accomplish. Detox clinics are really not suitable places for this long period of time. They're not, they're not set up to deal with this type of process. And um, the rapid withdrawal we're talking required takes adjunctive medication because of the risk of seizures and, and the risk of, of even death. So all this means that once a person has developed dependency, their options are extremely limited. So I feel like the only answer that I can give you is really we need to reduce the use of benzodiazepines. And what does this cost with what would this cost us to do this? Is this going to be a big loss in our communities and our society? First of all, I, I want to say that we just have to come across and to explain to ourselves that prescribing benzodiazepines is not just a benign intervention. It's not just a, a minor occurrence in a person's life. Because of how easily benzodiazepine dependence develops without anyone realizing it's happening and taking the medication at the level that it is prescribed, we need to do something about this. And at the least, they're going to have life-altering circumstances occur. And at the worst, it could potentially be life-threatening. So what are the warning signs that prescribing benzodiazepines is going to be detrimental? I'm talking about just prescribing them, not taking them, but prescribing them. Well, if you I think everyone knows this one, prescribing benzodiazepines to individuals with addiction history or addiction problems, that is going to be a problem, right? Everyone recognizes that one. But people don't often think that prescribing benzos when you're prescribing opioids or narcotics or barbiturates or people are using alcohol. They don't always recognize that that is a big danger. Also, when you prescribe benzodiazepines to assist with sleeping difficulties, you're more likely to create more sleep difficulties than you are to solve the sleep difficulties. And then also, if there's any long-term disorder or condition that a person is dealing with, like generalized anxiety disorder, you know, like OCD, something that is a long-term process, like post-traumatic stress disorder, this is going to put the person at great risk to use these medications for an extended period of time or to get into daily use of those medications. And so that is the time when prescribing them is likely to be detrimental. Also, someone whose anxiety is likely to have a chronic course, and that would include people who are coping with depression, people who are dealing with bereavement, people who are in a stressful life situation for some reason. You know, for example, maybe having a disabled child. <coughs> those individuals who are coping with a chronic stressor are at risk to start using those drugs on an everyday basis. 
any time you're prescribing benzodiazepines beyond three weeks. And if you read the PDR, I want to say, it's very clear just reading the PDR, says that these medications should not be prescribed beyond, you know, four to six weeks. Does anyone here know of benzodiazepines being prescribed beyond four to six weeks? So, I want to also be clear that it's really unfair to talk about this as addiction because these individuals were not seeking a drug as much as they were seeking relief from a condition typically. And they become dependent on a medication that they believe is helping them with a condition. And then they begin to have symptoms that only the medication relieves. So they become dependent on the medication and they know physiologically they don't know how to live without it. But they desperately don't want to take the medication and they wish they never started the medication typically. But let's remember, it's more accurately identified as an accidental addiction or dependency. And I don't even like that term of addiction because it brings up a whole lot of issues. Very, the vast number of people who are dealing with dependence on benzodiazepines develop that dependence taking a medication at the dosage and the rate that their physician recommended it. So we need to be aware of and sensitive to these kind of situations and spot the early signs of dependence. Sometimes it wants to Sometimes it doesn't want to Alright, so how do you spot dependence? Well, first of all, anytime you see daily benzodiazepine use is going beyond three weeks, start to be suspicious because that's when we see it occurring, right? So when I have people referred to me to, for treatment of some anxiety disorder and I ask them what medications they're taking and I know one of them is a benzo, then I'm, I'm asking how long you've been on that medication. And of course, if it's been less than, than three weeks, I'm telling them the importance of getting off it as soon as possible, getting off the medication as soon as they can. But if they've been on, they come in and say, I've been taking this for six months, I obviously am not going to tell them to get off it because of the effects of that. But watching for just using it beyond three weeks. Also, patients that complain that the medications are no longer effective, that they're taking it, but they don't think that they're effective, or that their anxiety problems or sleep problems are increasing, they're having more difficulty with insomnia, or if they're starting to have panic attacks. If individuals are also um, showing signs of, of misuse of the medication, they say they need to take more of it, they need to take it more often, or if they're showing withdrawal symptoms in between dosages, especially before they take their next dosage, they start to show anxiety showing up or headaches or blurred vision or confusion, forgetfulness, irritability, you know, difficulty falling asleep, body aches, pains, different things like that. And obviously, are these things you would think, let's consider benzodiazepine. Not typically, they're just common issues we see as part of life sometimes, except for some of this like blurred vision or confusion, but we tend to discount them or disregard them. So here's what's really concerning me. Look at some of the current studies that are being done. This is a 2018 study. We looked at benzodiazepine use between 1993 and 2014. And looking at when people were being prescribed, prescribed op opioids and benzodiazepines were prescribed along with them, right? And if you look at this, it went from an average of nine visits per 10,000 visits that included prescription of benzodiazepines when someone was taking opiate opioids to 62 visits per 10,000 visits. That's a 600% increase. We're going the wrong direction, despite the fact that we know about the dangers. And interestingly enough, the people who are most likely to be prescribed both of these medications together are 50 to 64 year old white insured individuals who are seeing their, their primary care physician. And they're complaining about sleep problems or anxiety problems and the physician prescribes a benzo or a Z drug and they're also on the opioids. And you're gonna see why I'm so concerned about this and it has to, it relates to overdose deaths. But one of the reasons that this really frustrates me as a psychologist is we have more effective ways of treating sleep difficulties. 
We have more effective ways of treating anxiety than these medications. In fact, we know that benzodiazepines are not long-term effective in treating these difficulties. And that we need to provide other kinds of interventions for these difficulties. Now here's the increase in overdose, overdose patients I wanted to talk to you about. Um, as the use has gone up, we're also seeing that there's an increase in the presence of benzodiazepines in overdose deaths. From 2004, when there were 18% of those deaths had, had benzodiazepines in them, to 31% in 2011. And if you look at this 2018 study I was talking about before, the opioid users who were prescribed benzos were 10 times more likely to die from overdose than those who were not prescribed benzodiazepines along with that. So we're finding that when we look at the opioid overdose crisis, benzodiazepines are clearly contributing to this. And it turns out that benzos have been prescribed in 49% of the non-fatal overdoses. They have been prescribed during the 180 days before that overdose. And in 19% of the fatal overdoses. And other studies have found numbers higher than that, 19% or around 30%. One of the things that we're very concerned about is that when you have benzodiazepine in your system, it really potentiates the opioid-induced um, respiratory, pro respiratory problems like respiratory suppression. So basically, individuals are unable to breathe because of the combination of these medications in their system. And there's a clear pattern in the overdose deaths. They, this study looked at 20,000 Medicare recipients, just the innocent individuals who are being prescribed medication. I want to point out, 68% of them had 180 days of overlapping supplies of benzodiazepines and opioids in their prescription history. And when we look to see when overdose occurred, it was in the first months of benzodiazepine prescription. And actually, in the first 90 days is the most dangerous time for a person to overdose with the um, hazard ratio being 5.05 for days 1 to 90. And after that period, going down to 1.87, which means these people have five times more a greater risk of overdosing in the first 90 days. Now this goes back to the idea that benzodiazepines can cause a lot of difficulty very quickly. That it only takes weeks for something bad to happen. In terms of dependence, in terms of combining with other drugs to lead to an overdose. And once again, I want to point out that white, disabled Medicare beneficiaries were the most likely to be being put at risk for this. And who among them were the ones that were having the most risk? Those who were being treated for depression and anxiety. And once again, depression and anxiety are not effectively treated with benzodiazepines. Neither one of those sets of disorders, mood disorders or anxiety disorders, are disorders for which benzodiazepines are an effective long-term treatment. So just remember, first of all, that benzodiazepines are not a first-line treatment. What are, just to remind you, what are the most effective treatments for anxiety disorders and anxiety-related disorders, like PTSD and OCD, which have now been pulled out into their own categories, but they're still anxiety-based? Well, they're the evidence-based psychotherapies, especially CBT therapies, are the ones that are the most effective and result in the most long-lasting improvements in these disorders. And due to their side effects, psychotropic medications are not even considered the first-line treatment. We try to treat them without medications at all. But if we are going to use medications, they're going to be the SSRIs and the SNRIs that really help people with anxiety disorders. So trying to remember that. And also, when we deal with insomnia, insomnia is something that is most effectively treated with CBT and not with any of the medications that we have. Even the Z drugs lose their effectiveness over time, and then they need to be replaced with an alternate intervention. And from my perspective, why give someone an intervention that is going to lose its effectiveness and you have to pay for an alternate intervention after that? When you go to the alternate intervention, the CBT for insomnia, look that up online, CBTI, look that up online, and that is 
an effective treatment. So if we could improve in just referring patients for psychotherapy prior to initiating psychopharmacological treatment for things like anxiety disorders, for insomnia, we could reduce a lot of the risks. And if you look at the VA uh, Department of Defense Practice Guidelines, they have been for years recommending against the routine use of benzodiazepines. And that's because they, they recognize the, there's no efficacy for treating PTSD with benzodiazepines, tend to make it worse, and they know that they also are at risk to be develop dependency. Okay, going back to this idea that we're at risk for overdose, look at the risk for overdose, what are the important factors that increase a person's risk for overdose? What are the important factors? Well, this study by, this 2018 study by Olson and, and colleagues, we looked at how do we identify the individuals who have experienced one overdose that they lived through and study them to see what ones might have an overdose afterwards. Try to present that, that overdose that becomes fatal. And so they're following up to see, do they have other overdoses? Do they experience fatal overdoses? And what they found, benzodiazepines were a clear, important factor. When they controlled for other variables, they found that if you, people had been prescribed benzodiazepines in the six months before that first overdose, those were the people that were having the most difficulty having continued overdose problems. And I want to tell you that these benzodiazepines change your brain and body in such a way that it's difficult to live in your skin with those medications not in your system once you become dependent on them. So recognizing these medications are very cheap, they're off patent, they're easily obtained, and the sad thing is the people who are instantly using them, especially older adults. Look at the, look at the ages here. Our 51 to 64-year-olds, long-term use of benzodiazepines, 28% come from that group. Long-term use, I'm talking about. People who are on benzodiazepine for a long period of time and are not going to be able to come off that without a great deal of difficulty. Now one thing we're finding is the psychiatrists are less likely to prescribe benzos long term. We see more primary care physicians are, are prescribing them and, um, and keeping people on them long term. And women are twice as likely to be using benzodiazepines and men, so it's definitely women are at greater risk. Also, who else is using them? Teens are more and more using Xanax. And you want to know where they get the Xanax? In their parents and their grandparents' medicine cabinets. And it's a medicine, and it can't be that dangerous because mom or dad or grandma or grandpa are using these medications. So they can't be that dangerous, right? And so some areas in the U.S. have seen a sharp increase in Xanax use among teens. Even though they see substance use going down among teens, Xanax use is going up. Many, many teens are coming in taking daily dosages or routinely combining the medication with alcohol and using it in what they think is just um, a way to control their stress or anxiety. And then once again, if we try to say prescribing benzodiazepines is contributing to overdosing, and most physicians don't even see the continuous use of benzodiazepines as a problem. They're feeling that it's, it's just a routine treatment. We're putting a lot of people at risk. And many physicians believe that they are effectively and erroneously treating anxiety and insomnia when that is not effectively occurring. I think physicians know how to consider the risk of substance use and substance abuse but they don't necessarily consider the risk of dependence on these substances. And if we could try to recognize long-term use of these medications as contributing to a lot of difficulties, I think we could make a big difference. But it's really gonna go back to trying to not prescribe them in the first place. And it's gonna to go to the idea of using more multifaceted interventions, incorporating patient education, incorporating psychotherapy, and not simply offering medications as a quick fix for problems. So here's the problem. I want to just kind of say, if you look at the overall problem, here's where it really happens, okay? 
patient comes in with a complaint of anxiety or worry or insomnia, physicians want to help, and so they have an inexpensive medication that right on hand that seems effective. The patients experience relief from that, and they go away feeling like this has been helpful. They feel like they were able to sleep for a couple days better. They were able to, maybe even weeks. They feel like their anxiety is more under control. Who is going to see that as a problem? It seems like it's great. But then as the medication use continues, and we're talking longer than three weeks, we're likely to see the increased need for more medication because dependence is developing. And so the first sign is increased anxiety. The person comes back saying, my anxiety is getting worse. What do you think is the most common response? Well, let's up the medication. It helped last time. Let's try to give you a little more of that. And the problem seems to go away. Or the person's having trouble sleeping, so I say, well, let's increase your dosage or switch you to a different medication. Another one, maybe a longer acting one, and we'll put you on that. And then once again, the problem seems to go away. And the patient reports improvement. But this is a pattern that continues until we have a problem that is very difficult to solve and very few people willing to assist in the solution process, all while the medications are being taken exactly as prescribed. So, okay, so going back to the forgotten group, the people who were looking for help on a website called Benzo Buddies because there wasn't there wasn't um, a physician who was willing to help them or people who believed that their symptoms were related to their medication. So if we go back to that, it raises certain questions. And those questions include, um, do we need to just reevaluate how frequently we're prescribing these medications? And do we have a responsibility to ensure that when people do get prescribed the medications that they have informed consent? that they know what it is that they're being prescribed and how it's supposed to be used. Do we um, offer benzodiazepines for a disorder that we know that there's a better treatment for and we're giving them an ineffective treatment that leads to problems? And are we offering sufficient services for people who become dependent on benzodiazepines? Well, I would say we need to carefully consider those questions and think about what we can do to help. First of all, the CDC has re revised their guidelines and said that if people are prescribing opioid analgesics, clinicians should avoid prescribing benzodiazepines with those prescriptions. That is in the current CDC guidelines. And before prescribing benzodiazepines for sleeping difficulties or anxiety or stress issues, more effective treatments need to be considered. People need to be referred for care. I met a woman who told me she'd been on, a 60-some-year-old woman, been on benzodiazepines for two years. I asked her why. She said, my son was shot and killed. I went to my doctor because I was dealing with the stress, and he put me on, and he's never taken me off. I have no idea why you would be put on benzodiazepines for dealing with grief, right? And now, she said, so should I stop taking them? And I said, absolutely not. You know, don't do that be an involved process. So what are the most more effective treatments? Psychotherapy, when you're treating anxiety and stress, or sleep. The SSRIs and SNRIs, if you're talking about medications, are much more effective for anxiety than the benzos are. And cognitive behavioral therapy has demonstrated effectiveness for treating anxiety disorders, PTSD, OCD. CBTI, cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, demonstrated to be effective. There's even online programs of CBTI that people can take. And if benzodiazepines are prescribed, people need to be told the risks of daily use. If you use one every once in a while when you're getting on a plane, or every once in a while you have to have a meeting with your boss or be in a group setting, you know, and you're stressed out, okay, but daily use is very different and changes the brain and the body. Now, our patients also need to be given this information, I think, in a clear form. And you know what would be good? A written form. So I want to thank the uh, Benzodiazepine Information Coalition for actually coming up with an informed consent form for benzodiazepine use that talks you through this, the information you need in order to decide 
if you should be on these medications and work with your doctor about using them effectively so they actually help the problems be treated. So that is, and it's actually on the website of the Benzo DSP Information Coalition, which by the way is benzoinfo.com, just to let you know, benzoinfo.com. So making sure that clients understand the risks of tolerance and dependence before they agree to take the medications. Uh, more things I would suggest is just keeping in mind how quickly benzodiazepines lead us into a, a, a lot of trouble. Very quickly dependency develops, remember that four week period, and also remember that's the first 90 days of prescribing benzodiazepines, even just not on a daily basis, but just the ability to take benzodiazepines at the same time you're taking opioids or drinking or taking other medications. Those first 90 days after the prescription are a high risk time for overdose to occur. And when daily use continues longer than three weeks, you need to review the use of the medication because you're getting to the stage where dependence is likely to be an imminent problem. And consider alternative treatments, other pharmacological treatments, interventions that are psychotherapy and patient education about what, what the effects of these medications are. And, and then the impact of benzodiazepines, how about the impact of benzodiazepines on other treatments? I'm a, a therapist who does a lot of exposure therapy. Benzodiazepines keep exposure from being effective because brains have to fire to rewire, and if you are taking medications, you have them in your system, the brain can't make the new connections that lead to the new learning that allow people to overcome their fears. So I can give, I can give, um, exposure treatments for months to a person who's taking benzodiazepines and they won't be effective. It's really discouraging. And then, if dependency does develop, we need to be offering some help to these individuals. Clients that are attempting cessation are going to need psychological support, they need physiological intervention, they need medical support, and it really is a long-term process. And very few physicians are willing to approach this. Right now, I'm talking to people who are driving out of state to find physicians willing to help them. And CBT also can be considered as an intervention because it's been shown to facilitate the cessation process uh, more effectively than non, non supportive therapy. Not, I'm sorry, more effectively than just supportive therapy. But even supportive therapy is better than people going through this on their own. You know, even if it's not the best therapy, this is a very difficult process that changes many aspects of a person's life to cope with. So, uh, gave you a lot of information in a short period of time, uh, willing to answer questions, and uh, tell me what you think. Are you seeing this happening, or is this just me? How many people are seeing this as a problem? Yes. So how, what are we going to do and how are we going to stop it? I, I really think it starts with prescribing them, especially if they were effective treatment, I would consider them. But when we have alternative effective treatments, why are we prescribing them? Yeah. Okay, so questions? Yeah. I'm a pain specialist and I inherit these patients that are already on benzodiazepine. Right, she says she's a pain specialist. She inherits patients that are on benzodiazepines. And it's very hard to stop the benzodiazepines. Very, very hard. Right. Now, I'm, you'll notice I am not advocating for people withdrawing from benzodiazepines once you're on them because they have dependency. I think, I think it's a decision. I've, I've worked with people who've decided the only way they could keep their job was to stay on them. And I think you just have to decide what you can do because there, it's not an easy process. And it's not easy to find therapists that can give you cognitive treatment. Yeah, and she's saying it's hard to find therapists to give treatment, right? So we, I mean, we, stop. we need to open some some assistance clinics, assistance here. Actually, you know, what I would really like to see is places where they're being prescribed to consider what else could be done for those individuals. I put them on SSRI and Buspar. Buspar is a good medicine. She's saying Buspar, she thinks, helps in SSRIs. But it doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't solve it. it. It doesn't solve the problem. Other comments or questions? Are... Is there a move to educate physicians and the public because of 
because I'm the corner. I, I'm the star of reality. You're corner. He stopped. He stopped this. He was real fast. Uh, but I see in over 40 percent of my cases of poly substance abuse as a result of death. Xanax is in every one of them. Xanax, you see repeatedly when you go over And more than that, THC. THC. Is in them. But I see all the time, like if you read the side of the clinical side of the clinical, what is one suicide attempt? You see that all the time. Right. And that's the other thing we see is people who, going through this process, just would rather die committing suicide rather than continuing to cope with this for years. People who are suicidal as a result of just experiencing this, this kind of... Yes, that's my question. Is there a pointed, determined effort to educate the physician? So the question is, is there a determined effort to educate physicians? about this. Well, obviously being here today is one of my attempts to try to reach out to people. But we were talking about the Benzone Information Coalition, talking about needing to go to conferences and talk to physicians. But is there anyone who is really taking this, um, for, for example, on the national level in our government concerned about this? Not that I know of. States have some states have identified this as a problem and are trying to work on this. Pennsylvania has been working on it, but also states have decided that this is just, you know, too much drama about a little pill and they're not willing to work on it. Um, so we have those kind of problems. I don't know that there's any, aside from private groups that are working on this, I don't know that there's a national. Does anyone know of that? If anyone knows of that, do you know something about that or you're talking about something else? Do you know of something? The insurance companies say this all the time. Insurance warnings, companies? Warnings, people that are used to medicine. We need to think about it, but it's hard to take these issues. They don't give us a solution. Well, I see insurance companies warning about the combination of medicines, but I don't see insurance companies warning about benzos. I don't see that. I see no, the combination. The combination. Oh, yeah, comment or question, yes. Thank you for your talk. I just 
wanted to add two other uh, sort of issues that I've encountered as a prescriber. Uh, first is that the first dose of presentazepine often comes from a self meaning friend or family member who says, you're having trouble sleeping here, try this, it works like a charm. And then the patient comes to the office and says, hey, my friend gave me, gave me this, yeah, I have it. Uh, so I think more education is needed for the general public to, to know that that action is not only dangerous, but also a felony. Uh, the other comment that I would add is that the insurance companies, again, uh, often have what's called step therapy, when, where when you try to offer a different class of medication for sleep, you know, to, to tell them this is someone with a sleep uh, or insomnia, they will come back and say, well, the patient needs to try one of the Z drugs, or they need to try one of the benzodiazepines, or they need to try, you know. And often that decision is driven by cost, because as we pointed out, these medications are, are generic and less expensive than some of the safer alternatives that might be still around.